What is going on, YouTubers, gamers, and hobbyists? And welcome to this episode of Board Games. And as you can see, the board game we're delving into in this episode is the Alley Cats game. Now, um, this is an old game, and I'll be showing you my copy, the picture of which is in front of you there. That's my copy of the game. As you can see, the uh, the boxes are a bit uh, bit worn around the edges, and that's because it survived several moves and various things over the years. Now, it's I've worked it out. It's about 39, 40 years old, this game, uh, as I had it when I was seven years old, and I'm nearly 47 now so I'm like, that's how old it makes it uh, a good 40 years old but anyway this first part of the video I'm going to talk about Ideal the uh, company which manufactured this game it's the Ideal toy company because um, I haven't spoken about them yet and once I've spoken about a company I won't go back to it there's no need to revisit it um, as such I can just concentrate on the games but um, the Ideal toy company that was an American toy company founded by Morrison Rose Mitchton uh, during the post-World War II baby boom era, Ideal became the largest doll-making company in the United States. Their most popular dolls included Betsy Wetsy, Tony, Saucy Walker, Shirley Temple, Miss Revlon, Patty Playpal, Tammy Fumbelina, Tiny Fumbelina, and Chrissy. Their last big hit was the Rubik's Cube. And uh, this was some odd sounding names there um, <laughs> but um, yeah that's uh, the sign of their times I guess anyway Morrison Rose Mitchton founded the Ideal Toy Company in oh, I, the Ideal Novelty and Toy Company sorry in Brooklyn when they invented the teddy bear in 1903 so that's quite interesting after Mitchton's death in 1938 the company changed its name to the Ideal Toy Company and Mitchton's nephew, Abraham Katz, became chief executive. During World War II, the company's value rose from $2 million to $11 million. The company's dolls were so popular during the post-World -war, War II baby boom era, they began selling dolls under license in Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom and Brazil. Key ideal employees during the 1950s, 60s and 70s were Lionel A. Weintraub uh, and Joseph C. Winkler. Weintraub, Weintraub, I think. W-E-I-N-T-R-A-U-B. Weintraub, Weintraub. <laughs> the son-in-law of Abraham Katz joined the company in 1941 and rose to become president, chairman of the board and the chief executive officer Winkler joined Ideal in 1956, rising to vice president uh, by 1971. In 1951, Ideal partnered with competitors, the American Character Doll Company and the Alexander Doll Company to establish the United States Israeli Toy and Plastic Corporation, designed to produce material for toys in Israel and the US. Ideal CEO Abraham Katz was named president of the new company. In 1968, the American Character Doll Company filed for bankruptcy and Ideal acquired the defunct company's dyes, patents and trademarks, as well as specific products like the Tressy Grow Hair Doll. Sounds interesting. In late 1971, the year I was born, <laughs> Ideal joined the New York Stock Exchange, valued at $71 million. It was one of the US's top three toy companies. By 1970, Ideal had outgrown its manufacturing complex in uh, Hollis, Queens. The company wanted to build a new plant in College Point, Queens, later the site of Shear Stadium, but was unable to strike a deal with the Lindsay administration. administration. <laughs> Consequently, the company opened a new facility in Newark, New Jersey, in the in early 1970s, while continuing to operate its factory in Hollis. Ideal had earnings of $3.7 million in fiscal year 1979 to 80, but lost $15.5 million in fiscal year 1980 to 81. Sales both years averaged $150 million. That's pretty cool. Trying to maximize profits on the Rubik's Cube craze in May 1981, Ideal filed civil suits against dozens of distributors and retailers selling knockoff cubes. I can remember that well, because uh, I think I had a knockoff cube, to be truthful. 
In May 1981, Joseph Winkler was named Ideal's president, succeeding Lionel Weintraub, who remained chairman and CEO. In 1982, the company moved its headquarters from Hollis, Queens, to Harmon Meadow, New Jersey. It was sold to CBS Toys later that year for, let me have a look here, $58 million. In 1987, CBS sold Ideal to Viewmaster International, which renamed itself Viewmaster Ideal in the process. In 1989, Viewmaster Ideal was bought by Tyco Toys of Mount Laurel, New Jersey, for $43.9 million. The Ideal line remained part of Tyco until Tyco's merger with Mattel, Inc. in 1997. Ideal's United Kingdom assets were sold to Hasbro, which has since released Mousetrap and Kaplunk under its MB Games brand. Other toys that originated with Ideal continue to be marketed and sold by other companies, including Rubik's Cube by Hasbro and Magic 8 Boy Ball by Mattel. The Ideal brand was revived by Plaza Toys on its Fiddlesticks Building Sticks products, but by January 2011 it was a proof it was a Poof Slinky brand, whatever that means. In January 2014, the Ideal brand became part of the new company, Alex Brands. After the May 2013 acquisition, Alex Toys by Propel Equity Partners. Okay. Products history. Ideal began making toys in 1907 to complement its line of teddy bears. Their first doll was Yellow Kid from Richard Felton Out Colt's comic strip of the same name. After that, Ideal began making a line of baby and character dolls such as Naughty Moretta from the Victor Herbert Operetta and Admiral Dot. Don't know that one. Ideal advertised their dolls as unbreakable since they were made of composition, a material made of sawdust and glue. Ideal produced over 200 variations of dolls throughout the composition era. Understanding branding well, Ideal had a boy, ball, boy doll launched in 1914 named the Un Anida Kid after a biscuit company. Well, that just sounds bizarre. One of Ideal's most lasting products was Betsy Wetsy, introduced in 1934. And in production for more than 50 years, the doll was named after the daughter of Abraham Katz, the head of the company, Ideal via the Betsy Wetsy doll was also one of the first doll manufacturers to produce an African-American version of a popular doll. In 2003, the Toy Industry Association named Betsy Wetsy to its Century of Toys list. A compilation commemorating the 100 most memorable and most creative toys of the 20th century. Debut, debuting in 1934, the Shirley Temple doll was their best-selling doll. Ideal follow-up with licensed Disney dolls and a Judy Garland doll. Two cosmetics-based doll series were launched after World War II. Tony was introduced at the end of the 1940s, followed by the 1950s dominating Miss Revlon series. Ideal had a hobby division in the 1950s, but shifted from that to games in 1962. By the early 70s, well, by the early 1970s, 30% of the company's sales were games such as Mousetrap and Hands Down. Doll designer Judith Albert worked for Ideal Toy Company from 1960 to 1982. Master sculptor Vincent J. De Filippo spent 27 years creating dolls for Ideal from 1963 to 1980. Some of the company's most popular dolls during this period were Tammy, 1962-66, Flatsy Dolls, 69-73, Chrissy, 69-74, and Tressy, 70-72. Popular ideal toys in the 1970s included a full line of Evil Knievel toys. Oh, do you remember that? Snoopy Toys and Tuesday Taylor and Wake Up Fumbelina Dolls. For a short time, the company had a huge seller with the Magic Cube, uh, which it imported from Hungary in 1980 and renamed Rubik's Cube. Well... What could I say? That's kind of a, a brief history of Ideal there, um, as thanks to Wikipedia. So thank you to Wikipedia for that information. But uh, anyway, enough of that. Let's get on with the game itself, and uh, I'll show you my set. Okay, so here is my copy of the Alley Cats game and as you can see and I think you'll agree it's in a pretty good condition given its age. 
Uh, now I remember, I can remember having this when I was like seven years old and I'm like 46 now, so a long time. This is a, a very old game, it's still all there, it's all the original components and the board is in incredible good condition, I think, given the usage it's had over the years. Now I'll, I'll just explain, first of all, this is a game of up to four players. Um, and if it's just two of you, one of you has to be on either side of this wall. So that represents a wall that cats go over into neighbouring uh, neighbourhoods and territories. And the, the objective of the game is really simple. It's to get five fish from over the opposite side of the wall. So if I was this older cat here, you have to go over the wall. So either that neighbourhood or that one there. So these four bins or these four bins and bring them back home. First one to get five fish. Uh, of course there are dogs in some of the bins. Um, there you go. That's just... So you get this out and there's a dog as well. And then he chases you back. There's also a fish in there as well. So if if you get home before the dog then you've kind of you've got an advantage there because you've got the fish quicker and that's basically what it is now I won't go into the rules too much but that's, that's pretty much it and you can steal fish from other players and so on uh, there are four main characters and as you can see and as you, I'm sure you can appreciate they're quite warm with age so what are they 39 years old now there's this older gentleman here Oh, he's Kane, old alley cat. Yeah. So I think he's probably one of the most uh, best conditions that there are. Uh, then there's this pirate one. He's actually got a, a patch on one eye and a scraggly tail. So that's the pirate one. There's a female one. It's quite one. Face is all worn out. It's obviously where people hold it. Um, and this scruffy cat that's like got a fishing line and uh, he's off fishing or whatever. Um, I don't know if they had names, I can't remember, I don't think so. Still the original dice as well. Wooden. So, yeah, wooden dice. And so many games have been played on this set. I, you know, I can wouldn't like to think of how many there are, although I'm thinking of it now. It's, it's an immeasurable number because I can remember playing when I was seven years old. Um, it might have been eight, a particular game. When it, we had a, a day, like a games day, we could bring your games and toys in. And instead of doing normal schoolwork, we, did, we just played games all day and that was great. And I brought in this game which is pretty remarkable that no pieces were lost. Although, actually one piece, I'll tell you a little quick story. One fish was stolen during time by a particularly nasty girl, although she did return it after a few days later. So I did get it back again. That's, that's another story for another, another time. Um, so, yeah, so I don't need to talk too much about that. Um, but these are the dustbins, the original dustbins that you came in. You can pick these up on eBay now, but they're quite expensive. Um, I'd be tempted to paint them now, like in a steel, because they wouldn't be uh, red, would they? But yeah, I'd be tempted to paint them up now. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. And what you do, you get the fish out and you hook it on your little... Each one's got like a tail or a hook, and this, this guy, in this case, it's his walking stick there on the end there. The fish hook's on there, and you, you go back. And cats on the wall can move along as well. But anyway, I digress. Yes, yeah, so I can remember particularly uh, one, one day. So I took this game in on a couple of occasions. I think once when I was seven, once when I was eight. Different years, like, you know. And um, there was a boy, one of my best friends, actually. He was called Mark Hallett. And he used to be all very excited as to whether there was a dog in the, um, the bin. So he'd be up to the bin, like say this, and he'd be going, ooh, ooh, 
no, there's no dog. And you get really intense, like, <laughs> I don't know why that sticks in my mind, it just does, but, um, you know, this is one of those games which, I mean, we played this at Christmas, um, the family and friend who came over on Christmas Day, and we had such good fun with it. It was like, you know, four of us playing, and we had an immense sense. And when there's four of you playing, there isn't enough fish to go round, really. Um, so it's possible to get a draw. I think we did on one of the games, but um, so it, you know, it gets to a point where the only way you can win is by stealing fish, and that, that's kind of fun as well. Uh, I remember, my my wife's mission was to just steal and not bother getting any of of her own. And that was kind of funny. <laughs> so you can do, you can play it whatever way you want, really. But uh, so each neighbourhood has a dog. So in these four, somewhere there's going to be a dog. Um, once you've got a fish from a dustbin, you have to turn, take it back home before you can go out again. So you can't get one fish, go to another dustbin, get another fish, and then so on, until you've been back or it's been taken off you or whatever. So if you have a fish, you have to return home with it. Um, and that, that's about it, really. Uh, and it's such a fun game. but. Later on in life, when I moved to Plymouth, uh, my friend and I used to play this many times when I was like 11, 12, 13 years old. And uh, we used to have many, many games of this at my house. The Alley Cats game. Um, of course, it's by Ideal, which um, I should have talked about by now at this point in the video, so um, I won't go into that. But uh, yeah. And there's a few things on here, like move back two spaces, miss a go, go back home, that kind of thing. And um, it makes for a really enjoyable game. It's clear, it's concise. You don't get games like this with the boards so much where they fold open. It's a big board as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I just really, really enjoy it. It's, uh, it holds up today. And what I'm going to be looking to do is to try and I don't know locate new stickers or maybe draw in the details um, like on the faces and that again and, and put and what I would do is I'd put a uh, I'd put a layer of um, varnish over the top of them or something to protect them because um, yeah I don't want to uh, further kind of destroy the the drawings on on them all the stickers as it were um, so there's a possibility so I'm always on the lookout for spares you know um, for this although like I say this, this game is pretty intact I think for 39 years nearly 40 years old you you'd be hard-pressed to get a game in better condition than this one and um yeah I, I i just i'm really glad i've got it i will never ever ever let it go because it holds such good memories for me um uh, not least of which is memories of my friends um playing with my friends when i was a kid and that you know I'm, unfortunately one of them is dead now uh they passed away so holds many dear memories for me <laughs> um and yeah, so thank you very much for watching. Keep your eye out, there will be other games as well. Six, yay. Uh, there will be other games on the way, so um, yeah. Oh, the, before I go, there was an advert for this game, I remember, that came on the telly, which was why I wanted it. I wanted specifically this game, and my sister bought me it for, it was either Christmas or birthday. Something tells me it was for Christmas. Um, more than birthday but I could be wrong there but it was definitely my sister that bought this for me and um, yeah because there was an advert like a sort of cartoon advert um, advertising the game by Ideal uh, that came on the telly and um, yeah that's why I wanted it <laughs> but it's a great game a lot of components for a game of this um, nature and um, 
particularly for young children, it's a miracle that they keep all the pieces. So you see a lot of spares for sale on eBay. Now, either just dustbins or just fish or, you know, just a board or just a box, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, intact and we'll be looking to replace these stickers or improve on them at some point. So keep an eye out for that. But thanks very much for watching, guys. Remember, all brushes lead to war. And I will see you on the next video. Bye for now. Bye-bye.